that you've been with us and you've helped us and you've been kind to us because we don't even know what we should ask for when we pray like we should, Lord. You know, you would think that when we became a Christian, we'd know a lot more than what we know. And Lord, without you, we can do nothing. And so, Father, this morning, we ask you to help us to touch our hearts and to touch our minds and, Lord, make us ready. Make us suitable for your heaven. Make us suitable <laughs> for your disciples. And, Lord, we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. When we are saved, I think we're going to recognize our sinfulness. I look back on some of the things that I've done in my life and I see just how sinful I was. <laughs> and sometimes I don't like what I see. And so, the first thing I think we have to do as Christians is we have to admit, according to the Word of God, we have to admit that we are sinners. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Some people don't think they sin. I ain't done nothing. I'm a pretty good person. I'm, I no, I never killed nobody. I never went to jail. You know? But you know why a lot of people ain't went to jail? They just hadn't got caught yet. That's all. They just hadn't got caught yet. And there's plenty of reason to catch them. And even the slowest things are here in West Virginia, they will catch up with them. Eventually, they're not going to get over. West Virginia is making strides in doing things. <laughs> Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. None. You know, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. That's the deal. We do the things that we do because of what we are. You know, Adam was the one that committed the first sin. He walked into that openly, just like sometimes you do. You know you're supposed to do something, and you do it against God, say, I'm not going to do it. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You see, that's the deal. You sit up here, and uh, you have a mama, and you have your daddy, which is great. I mean, there's nobody going to get here without one of each, unless you're a test tube baby. And still yet, you still have to have a mom and a daddy. But there's another thing you have to have, and that's a spirit. And you see, that spirit from Adam was multiplied to his children. And that's why we don't see children, though they have the equipment, and though they may be able to produce a child, they're not able to produce the spirit because the, the spirit isn't ready to be divided or multiplied yet. Kind of like our cells in our body. You see a one cell and all of a sudden you watch under a microscope and it, it enlarges a little bit and it separates. That, what's it done? It multiplied. It didn't just have a baby, another baby cell. It multiplied. And that's what our spirit does. It multiplies. And so when that person is ready to, uh, the spirit is ready, then when that person gets united with a opposite sex, the woman that receive, uh, furnishes the body, and the man furnishes the spirit. And if it's a bad spirit, well, it came from the man, remember that. But the woman has the same kind of spirit, so the only thing she does, though, is supply the, the body. <clears throat> and so, the very sin that Adam did, I'm not going to do what God said to do, that's what we're doing. Because we have that spirit. And that's why he says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. For all have sinned. You know. So, yes, Adam committed the original sin. 
God told Adam and Eve that they would die on the very day they sinned. They told them not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, the Bible says, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. But yet they lived a lot of years after they ate it, didn't they? So how could this be? Is the Bible just saying stuff and not doing it? Well, they died spiritually. That's why we receive a dead spirit. Or a spirit that's not alive to God, because the spirit can't die. So... Their physical life lived on, but their physical life and their spirit life is two separate entities. And their one spiritual life was alienated from God, and it couldn't ever get right with God in the condition it was in, because it could not say, God, okay, I'll do the right thing, because God imputed the sin to them. They had sinned. Now what was they going to do about it? Because God is in no wise going to acquit the guilty. There's no way you're going to get acquitted of your crimes. So you think about it. The only thing that you can do is have a covering for your sin. And that's through Jesus Christ. Without Jesus we have no covering. We have nothing to atone for our sinfulness. Well, what happened with Adam... The perfect relationship with God was over. How do you expect to have a perfect relationship with God without Jesus Christ? And if you do have Jesus Christ, why is it that you're continuing to live in sin like you don't have a relationship with God? You see, the sin nature causes you to be an, en an enemy of God. God says, do this, and you say, well, look at God, I'm not doing that. Do what I want to do. You ain't going to tell me what to do. That's what Adam did, isn't it? And what about you now? This morning when God tells you to do something, thou shalt not kill. Well, I won't kill that fellow. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let me tell you something. What are you saying to God? I'm not doing it your way. I'm going to do it my way. You think God's not going to hold you accountable for it? You say, God, you messed up making that person, so I'm going to help you out. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> so now you're a better judge than God is, huh? So now, because now the judgments in your hands are no longer in God's hands. So we need to think about what we're saying and what we do. You know, our sin nature puts us being an enemy of God. Why do you want to be God's enemy? The days of paradise comes to an end then, doesn't they? Oh, Lord, how come you're not answering my prayer? Lord, why are you healing me? Well, the days in the Garden of Eden is over. So that's why. Because you prefer sin instead of God. So your days in the Garden are finished. <coughs> how are you going to get back in the Garden? We look at the sin nature that all humans are born with. And we've got these preachers out there today. They call themselves preachers. Oh, well, that child has to get to the age of accountability before it's a... The Bible says all have sinned. There is none righteous, not one. It doesn't say they have to reach an age of accountability. That's something that mankind put in here. That's a lie from the pits of hell. So these lazy men and women won't put their children in church and care for them. Oh, well, if they do put them in church, oh, it's the Sunday school teacher's job to teach them. I go out and walk to church like I do at kindergarten. They don't care about their own children. And then when their children grow up as haters of God, backbiters and all that, oh, they won't go to that kid. Well, I don't, I know what's wrong with it. Look at the mom and daddy. We can see what's wrong with the children. <laughs> Look what mom and daddy's done. Have they done the right thing? Well, if they didn't, it shows in the children, don't they? Because what's the Bible say? You're going to be known by your fruit? Huh? 
If you plant apples, you're going to get apples. You're not going to get tomatoes or pears. You're going to get apples. Yeah, if they're rotten, you're going to get a whole bunch of rotten apples. <laughs> Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all, for that all have sinned. Ain't nobody not sinned. Everybody needs to go to hell. <coughs> and this teaches us that Adam's spiritual death passed down upon everybody because that dead spirit, if you want to call it a dead spirit, even though a spirit can't die, but when I say a dead spirit, that means that spirit is not in communion with God. It has to be quickened, brought back into a communion with God. And so it means that we are all born spiritually dead or away from God. Either way, you want to look at it. Take a child. The Bible says the wicked are estranged from the womb. And they go about, as soon as they be born, speaking lies. But when you, how does a baby talk lies? Well, you bring that baby into the world that just came out of its mama's womb, and it's screaming its lungs out, and you plop a bottle in its mouth. Is that baby hungry? No, it just lied. It was screaming and hollering. You put that bottle in its mouth, and it lets you know it just told you a lie. And it's laying there on the bed, you screaming and hollering, and you look over there and you feel the diaper and it's all dry, and you try to give it the bottle, you don't want the bottle, but when you pick it up, that baby just lied again because it told you there's something wrong with me. The only thing wrong with it wants you to pick it up. That's all that was wrong with it. <laughs> right. And so, <laughs> don't tell me babies don't lie. And so we got this whole theology out there from these fallen pastors that say they have to reach an age of accountability. They're liars. They do not know the word of God and they don't know what they're talking about. All have sinned. It leaves none out. It does no, it says nowhere in the Bible about having to reach an age of accountability before they're accountable for their sin. They are accountable for their sin the moment they're born. Period. Adam and Eve would have lived forever if they had not sinned. Could that baby die? Why not? Well, he can't die until it reaches the age of accountability, or God's going to cause a child to die. And wait a minute, he's going to let a child die that has never sinned. Wouldn't that be awful for God to do that? What about all the sudden infant death that we've had in the past? God was very wrong then, wasn't he? Think about it. Each person must be born again. If you are not born again, you are spiritually dead to God. You can't have communion with God, you can't do anything with God because you're spiritually dead. <coughs> being born again means being born for the second time. There is a physical birth and there is a spiritual birth. When we are born spiritually dead into the world, we're born spiritually dead without being able to be in touch with God. And so that means we are all born with a part of nature. We all have a natural tendency to sin, a default. Like you go on somebody's Microsoft computer and it brings up the Word or whatever is on your telephone. Take a look on your phone. There's a thing that says fonts. F-O-N-T-S. That means the size of the letters and what kind of letters and all that's on there. And you can set them. And then you can set the default on it as being whatever you prefer. And so, you are born with that default. All have sinned. You come into this world as all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so, this nature has been passed down to us from Adam. That spirit is multiplied to you when you are born. That's why you couldn't have had a father that didn't have a mature enough spirit to, to multiply that spirit. No one needs to teach a child how to steal or how to lie, do they? Yeah. 
They just pitch off second nature to them, huh? No, it's their first nature. They're liars and thieves and robbers and everything else. You don't have to teach them how to do this stuff. They're born that way. Children need to be taught not to do these things. The only two people in this world that were ever born without a fallen nature were who? Adam and Eve? No. Adam and Jesus. Adam came into this world perfect, just like Jesus did. Adam chose to sin. Jesus chose to not sin. And so you believe that you have sinned because it's Adam's fault. Why don't you believe that you can be saved through Jesus Christ? Because now it's Jesus' fault you're saved in, huh? If you believe it's Adam's fault, then it has to be Jesus' fault you're saved. Think about how much sense that makes to you. Jesus never sinned, not even once. He wasn't he wouldn't, he wouldn't have sinned. Well... He the one giving the apple. But Adam was the one that was in the transgression because, just like it should be in your house, you're the man in charge. And your family is supposed to be subject unto you. And so Adam loved his wife more than he loved God. Now, who do you love more than God? Because whomever you're listening to, and you're not listening to God, that's the one you're loving more than God. Adam simply loved his wife more than he loved God. So he listened to his wife. That was his sin. You see, the sin wasn't imputed to Eve. It was imputed to Adam because he was the man in charge. And so that puts us men that are the heads of families like we are, that puts us in a particular situation because our children are born and they're born with our sin nature. So... As a man, it should be more up to us to make sure that our children get saved more so than our wives. But how many times do we see that the case? You know, Adam became a sinner and he died spiritually the moment he sinned. And you know something else? I don't read in the Bible anywhere that Adam ever repented. I don't see in the Bible where he repented, but the Bible does say that all who live in Adam will die. Think about that. And the Bible does say, Wherefore by one man sin entered into the world, and death passed upon all, for then all have sinned. So, and that one man being Adam. And so where does it say he repented? And what about you this morning? Where is it, where is it written that you have repented? And turned to God and gave your life and been born again. Where is it written that? That you've made the right decision. Does your work show that you've made the right decision? That thou shalt confess with thy mouth and shalt believe in thine heart that thou shalt be saved? Well, I ask Jesus to come into my heart. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And then you're saved. Not to ask Jesus into your heart. Not to have every eye closed and every head bowed and all this other stuff. That's not what the Bible says. To, how are you going to confess Jesus Christ with your mouth if you've got your head bowed and not looking around? How are you going to tell someone I just got saved? That's the whole thing. If you confess with your mouth, I got saved. And you shall believe in your heart that you got saved. And you are saved. And if you don't, then you're not. But make sure you have believed it in your heart. Don't believe it in your mind because your mind and your heart is 18 inches apart. Your mind is up here. Your heart is somewhere in here. About 18 inches. Don't miss heaven for 18 inches. Huh? <laughs> or miss heaven by 18 inches. Oh, I'm all right there! If, I thought you just reach up there and touch it, huh? Think about it. The rest of us don't have a choice like, like Adam had. <clears throat> Adam chose to do what he did. <laughs> we had it passed down on us. How do you think your children feel? 
When they look at the Bible, when they look at people going to church, and they look at it, it's your fault. I'm your child. Why didn't you teach me better? Why didn't you do this for me? And when you get to hell with your children, they're going to be standing there in hell and wonder, why didn't you do this to us? Why didn't you tell us about Jesus? Yeah. You're going to have to answer to your children that you're taking to hell with you. It's going to be bad. Because you're going to see your baby suffering. And you're not going to be able to do anything about it. We're all descendants of Adam. Therefore, we're all born with that same sin nature that Adam acquired when he decided he wasn't going to do what God said. When have you, when have you decided you're not going to do what God said to do? Huh? Was it last month? Last week? This morning? Huh? Adam did it a long time ago and you're blaming him. What about you? Because if he hasn't done it, you are. <laughs> well, you think it don't matter? Well, it matters to you, it matters to God, but what about your children? How do they see you? Snake in the grass mama? Snake in the grass daddy? Is that what they see? <clears throat> what are you doing about it to change it? We've all sinned. We all have that sin nature that we got from Adam. We're all born spiritually dead. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the only way we're going to get out of this predicament that we're in is through Jesus Christ. Another man can't help you. Your daddy can't help you. Your mama can't help you. Nobody can help you but Jesus. It was absolutely necessary that Jesus would offer himself as a sacrifice. All of y'all realize this morning that you're guilty sinners? Do all of you realize that this morning that you are guilty sinners and you deserve to go to hell. Yeah. Every one of us are guilty sinners and every one of us deserves to go to hell because we have broken God's law. Now let me ask you something. Now that you know that you're a guilty sinner and you deserve to go to hell and you say, well, what can I do to help myself? Well, for starters, you can start doing what God said to do. Huh? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And does that mean after you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, just continue on? Okay, I'll do what God says today, but I ain't going to do it tomorrow. I don't know. I'll do it while I'm in church, but when I leave this church, I ain't doing nothing. Is that right, God? Come <laughs> here. You know what? <laughs> Let me get a cough drop up here. <coughs> the devil tried to kill me last week. Oh my. Again. We can't save ourselves. What are you going to do about it? You can't save yourself, so what are you going to do about it? We can't do anything. You can't make a deal with God. Say, God, if you'll do this, I'll do that. You say, well, God, you know, if you'll help me out with this, I'm going to do this for you. You can't deal with God. Only thing you can do with God is what He says to do. If you do what He says to do, He's happy. And if you don't, well, you do it at your pearl, then don't you? It will be your fault whatever happens to you. We can't do anything of our own effort to reconcile ourselves to God. All of our good works can't save us. Marie, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to read verses 8 through 10 when you get there. Ephesians chapter 2. 
This is the verse that y'all should remember sometimes. Because a lot of people say, oh, I got saved. And then I heard people say, oh, I got so and so saved. Lord, I had this person in prayer and they got saved because I saved them. Go ahead. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Are you doing the works that God says to do? Are you saved this morning? If you are, you didn't get yourself saved. You did what God said to do to get saved. If you don't do what God says to do, you don't get saved. That's just that simple. You don't ask Jesus to come into your heart. That's not what the Bible says. Because asking Jesus to come into your heart means you pray a prayer to get saved. <laughs> And you're telling God, oh, you've got to come down from heaven and come and get in my heart. That's not the way to get saved. How do you get saved, though? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. That's how you get saved. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe in Jesus Christ. You can't brag about your self-righteousness. Especially to God, because you have no self-righteousness. Not on your own. Adam and Eve, well, what could they do to change what they had done? What can you do to change what you've done? You know, i got people in my past that hate me for things I've done 50 years ago or 60 years ago, probably. You know what? I can't do nothing to change anything that I've ever done. I, there's nothing that I can do to change it. I can get out there and wallow in my sin some more, but I can't change it. Because what's in the past is in the past. Now I can do what God wants me to do. Living for the Lord and living with the Lord. When you look at Ephesians chapter 2 here, they could be no plainer. You cannot do anything to get yourself into heaven on your own. You can do nothing. There's no way you can earn your way to heaven. You can't say, Jesus, come into my heart. There's nothing that you can do to get yourself saved. All of our good works, what they're going to get us? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6 that all of our good works are like filthy rags. Yeah. All of our works are like filthy rags. You know, all have sinned and we are all bound for hell. Now what are you going to do about it? Well, God has a plan. Option number two. Okay. Option number one, all have sinned. Option number two, come to Jesus Christ and get saved. You know, salvation is God's free gift to us, but it wasn't free. Jesus paid the price of it on the cross. He paid the price for your salvation. No matter how many good deeds you did, you might be got baptized. You might be done a whole lot of things in your life. But that didn't stop what Jesus did on the cross for you. He paid for your sin debt. And if you commit even the smallest of sins, you're guilty. You ever told a lie? You ever stole anything? Think about it. That makes you a lying thief. <laughs> or makes you a thief and a liar. And you want to get to heaven being a thief and a liar? And some of you talk about killing people? Well, that makes you a thief, a liar, and a murderer too? <laughs> the Bible says you're not going to heaven like that. And so, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 tells us, 
not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. We have to be born again. And that renewing of the Holy Ghost is what makes us be born again because that renewing brings that spirit back to life again. Because it was dead when you it came to live inside of you. Isaiah, again, like I said in Isaiah 64, verse 6, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. Think about it. God hates sin so much, he can't even give it to us in words that we can understand. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Think about how God feels about you when you don't come to church. He hates that situation. What else are you doing that causes God to just have his stomach turning over what you're doing? God looks at all the good things we do, <laughs> and what does he see? Filthy rags. That's the good thing. What about the bad things we do? God loves our good works, but he hates us to trust in our own self-righteousness. Salvation is about receiving, not giving. If you're trying to please God with the nice things you do in hopes of making it to heaven someday, I got news for you. You're in for a surprise. As Christians, we do what we do because we are Christians. We're not doing this to please God so we can get into heaven. We're doing it because we are what we are. You know, if you're a giraffe, you have a long neck like a giraffe has. You don't have a neck like a orangutan or a gorilla. You have a neck like a giraffe. If you're a Christian, you're going to have a certain way you are too. You know, Christians are not the same as a giraffe. Just like a giraffe is not the same as a possum. You know, wake up. There are different kinds of creatures. What kind of a creature are you? Committing one sin. How do we James 2? If you commit one sin, what happens to us in the eyes of God? Bring up verse 10. Go ahead, Marie, you read it. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. And so, what does he say about that in the next verse? For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So you see, whatever you're doing, you're breaking God's law. And so it makes you guilty of, of being a murderer. Yeah. You can be an adulterer, and as far as the law is concerned, you're a murderer. Mm. Maybe, that, uh, maybe this doesn't sound fair to you this morning. Well, maybe it doesn't sound fair to God that a sinner is a sinner, huh? Sin, sin, God. That's right. And whether you sin once or a thousand times, mm -hmm. you're still a sinner and you still need a Savior. Yeah. Adam and Eve sinned just one time. And look at the condemnation it caused him. One time. They didn't kill nobody. They didn't get out there and lie to God. What did they do? They just didn't do what God said to do. They plucked off, maybe it was an apple or a pear, who knows. One person said it wasn't a problem with the apple on the tree, it was a pear on the ground. I don't know. <laughs> maybe that pear fell down on the ground or something, huh? Or maybe it was just a pear. The pear, too. Yeah, the two of them, the pear. Yeah. That's all they did was eat that forbidden fruit. 
And look what happened to them. What have you done? What have you done to deserve hell? The Bible said there's none righteous. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. God is simply trying to show us. Think about it. Maybe you thought she was a pretty good person. Maybe you thought I hadn't done that. I'm not such a bad person. I hadn't done this and that and the other. The Bible said there's none righteous. Not even one. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 10. I've had a lot of people tell me that I haven't sinned. I ain't been doing nothing wrong. I'm not like you. I've never been to prison. Well, the Bible says what? 1 John chapter 1 verse 10. Right? If we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word, and his word is not in us. <laughs> so you calling God a liar? Huh? The law shows us just how wicked we really are. And how does the law show us that? Romans chapter 3 again, please. And verse 20 tells us, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. If there wasn't a law that said, Thou shalt not sin, then God wouldn't have a thing to do with, with us then, would he? Because we would none of us be wrong. But there is a law that says, Thou shalt not. Don't eat of that tree. Don't commit adultery or whatever. The law condemns us, and then the law points us to Christ. Cain and Abel. You know, Cain killed Abel, and yet the law of Moses was not even given yet. Was it? No. But did that mean Cain wasn't still accountable? Yes, he was. He was still accountable. Romans chapter 3 verse 19 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. The reason God gave us the law was to reveal to us just how wicked that we really are. Not one person has ever kept the law but Jesus Christ. So the law shows us our hopeless condition and then it points us to Jesus Christ, the solution for our hopeless condition. Salvation comes by Jesus Christ. It does not come from us being baptized. It doesn't come from saying, Jesus, come into our hearts. It comes from us confessing Jesus with our mouth because we believe what he did in our hearts. That makes us born again Christians because we believe in God. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Keeping the Ten Commandments, I'm not going to get to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments. Being a nice person, well, God doesn't want you to be an ugly person, but being a nice person is not going to get you to heaven. Getting baptized, yeah, God wants you to get baptized, but getting baptized is not going to get you to heaven. Because you can be baptized and not even believe in God. Is that going to get you to heaven because you're baptized? Come on now. The law shows us that we need Jesus. He says in Romans chapter 7, and this is a very good chapter for all of us to read more than one time in our lives. It says in verse 13, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, 
working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Sin, the law, having done its job, we have to admit to God that there's no way that we can save ourselves. We can't go back and undo what we've done. We can't change nothing we've done. A lot of people face a thing that makes themselves self-righteous. But they try to do this to make themselves look better in the eyes of someone else. We need to admit that we're just hopelessly lost all by ourselves. And nothing we can do to help ourselves. There are people that... Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. There are people that compare themselves with other people. I'm so glad I'm not like you. Well, I'll tell you what, you people this and you people that. They compare themselves among themselves. And the Bible says what, Marie? For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. <laughs> and so don't compare yourselves among other people. Let God look at you. Have you done what God said to do? Or no? Every one of us was created in God's image. But every one of us unique in our own way. Though we were created in God's image, we have a spirit of a fallen spirit within inside of us. It has to be born again. There is no other person just like you on this whole earth. There won't be another dar, no matter where you look, there'll be not another one just like her. Nowhere. One of a kind. <laughs> You are one of a kind, just like Loretta, Charlie, every one of us are one of a kind. There won't be another just like each one of us. And so we have to be careful about comparing ourselves with other people. This is very easy to view oneself as being righteous or okay. Hmm. Just turn on the news one night, you'll see how righteous we are. We hear about all the stuff that's going on. And you think we're bad, you ought to look into the White House, what's happening there. <laughs> how, how do any of them folks think they're going to get into heaven acting like they're acting? Doing the things that people are doing. How do ever any of them going to make it to heaven? You know what, I think they don't care. There are some real sick people in this world. And we call them leaders. <laughs> Does that mean they're leading us to hell? If there are leaders? Even some believers sometimes can commit some bad crimes when they get away from God. You know people close to you right now that's been in the church. Probably born again Christian, but yet the devil's going to take you further than you was planning on going, no matter who you are. We just need to trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. Because if we don't, we're going to trust ourselves. That's some kind of stinking thinking that God's where we're at in, isn't it? If we compare ourselves to a holy God, turn with me to Isaiah chapter six. Isaiah said in the, this is this is kind of awesome to me though. I think about what Isaiah had to say lots of times, and we get all the way up to the sixth chapter, and here's a prophet of God. Which goes to show us God can use us no matter where we're at. But he says in verse, verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high lifted up. 
had to be a death in his family or someone close to him before he could even see who God was. It looks like what's he even doing being a prophet? And I like what he says in verse 5. This said I, what, Marie? This said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. <laughs> we read about another man in the Bible. Isaiah says, I'm just a dirty old man. <laughs> I got some, I got a filthy mouth. You have to realize where you're at and what you're doing before there can be a change in your life. You have to realize that you are a sinner needing salvation. In Luke chapter 18, there's a story about two men. I'm going to close here with this this morning. And it says they went up to pray. Verse 10, he said, one of them was a Pharisee, and the other one was a publican. A Pharisee and a publican. Now think about that. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself. Oh God, I thank thee that I'm not like these other men. They're extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Wow. I thank you, Lord, that I'm such a good person. <laughs> think about that. Have you ever thought that? Oh, this person over here, they have a bunch of no good scoundrels. And I'm such a good person, he says. Then he says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. He's trying to work his way to heaven then, isn't he? But the public in verse 13 says, what, Marie? And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, which one did the Lord like the best of the two men here? The Read the next verse. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now we read about the publican and the Pharisee. The Pharisee compared himself to other men. Actually, he was comparing himself to the publican that was there at the time. And he said, Lord, I thank you I'm not like other men. Like this old scallywag publican over here. <laughs> That's the expression he was using. But Jesus said the publican was justified. Why? Because he admitted that he was a sinner and there wasn't nothing he could do to help himself. And that's what we have to do. There's nothing that we can do to help ourselves. So you're here this morning and you feel like, man, what must I do to be saved? Well, let's see what the Bible says. What must I do to be saved? Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Don't be like the Pharisee making the mistake of comparing yourself to someone else. What does the Bible say, Marie? Acts 17. Acts 17, 30. Third. Yeah. And the times of this ignorant God went at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. In verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in, in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. So he hath given us assurance. So before God has said, what? That he just went with the sin. Huh? At, at the times of this ignorance, God winked at. 
He winked at our sin before, but now he's done what? He's, he's uh, appointed the day in the time which you have judged the world in righteousness. Okay. Now God winked at your sin before. Does that mean he said it was okay? No, but he winked at it. Back up one chapter to chapter 16, the same verse, verse 30. Chapter 16, verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? What must you do to be saved? What do you say? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thou house. All right, then I want you to go back to Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. What must I do to be saved? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. That's right, dear. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only by the name of Jesus Christ can you be saved. Right. Not by something that you have done. Right. And Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 said, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, and shalt believe in thine heart, thou shalt be saved. Now this morning, have you confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart? But, what did he say about <clears throat> your sin? Remember Acts 17, 30? What did he say about your sin? That means you're not doing what God said to do. What did he say about that? He said he winked at it before, but now he's commanded you to what? Repent? Yes. So does that mean because nobody sees me, or sees this certain woman having sex with a certain man, that means it isn't happening? Because God sees it, huh? And he says, I commanded everyone to repent. Isn't that what he said? <clears throat> what about lying? Same, same. Stealing? Same, 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 same. Robbing God? <laughs> How many people are really doing what God says to do then? Not many, huh? And then everybody says, I'm going to heaven. But that's why he says, you. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. You need to make up your mind. It's either going to be God or the devil. If you're going to do what the devil says, he's going to take you further than you've planned on going. I was on the road to Martinsville, but the devil's going to take you all the way to Wheeling. Well, I was on the road to Wheeling, the devil's going to take you to Bud Tussle, Oklahoma. <laughs> You know what? If you want to be saved, the Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't, are you going to be saved? Well, what if you believe and you don't want to do what he says? He's commanded us to repent. Maybe he's not going to accept you as being saved, huh? Because you don't want to do what he said because he's commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now repentance is not getting you saved, it's doing what you're supposed to do after you are saved. And so you're just proving whether you are saved or not then, aren't you? Huh? Okay. Let's have an altar call, Marie. Song of invitation, please. As we close.